Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I haven't been in these archives in probably six or seven years since I was doing research for this book. So it's a, a, a real pleasure to be back here, and I appreciate you guys taking time out of uh, your busy schedules to come and uh, listen to me talk a little bit about George Washington Carver. I'm still not used to people coming to listen to me speak, but then I always look at a picture of this guy up here. I think they're not really coming to hear me. They're coming to hear about uh, George Washington Carver, which takes a little bit of the pressure off. Um, I'm going to start, I think, um, and I should uh, begin, I should I suppose, by thanking Sherry for setting all this up and uh, the Alabama Department of Archives and History for having me here. Um, but I, w I really want to begin with a little bit of background on how I came to write the book I did, Why an Environmental Biography, uh, Why the Title, um, all of that sort of stuff. And uh, I, I started doing this after I gave a talk at uh, the Franklin Institute of Science in Philadelphia on Carver in well, probably 2008. And after the... Uh, can you hear me if I walk, if I pace? I'm sort of by habit a, a, a pacer. Um, uh, I was at the Franklin Institute and afterwards a, a woman came up and uh, said, why would you uh, say these terrible things about Dr. Carver and all of this sort of thing? And, I, and she had conflated what I was arguing against <laughs> with what I was arguing. And so I want to be really clear at the beginning and lay out exactly the, the uh, scholarly context for why I wrote the book and then the public context for why I wrote the book and how they sort of uh, come together, how they, I think, dovetail nicely. Um, when I first started uh, researching this project, which began as a dissertation, um, there were only two scholarly works on Carver, two scholarly book-length works on Carver um, that had ever been written, which is really surprising to me because Carver is an iconic figure. Now, I should note that by uh, scholarly, I mean a, a book that documents its sources, that tells you where it got the information from so you could go back and check it, right? Only two. Uh, the first of these wasn't published until 1981, which was maybe even more surprising. That's uh, Linda McMurray's uh, George Washington Carver, Scientist and Symbol, uh, which uh, is, I think, is, I think, 30 years later, still holds up, for the most part, pretty well. Um, and she's interested, as the subtitle indicates, in his uh, work, in Carver's work as a, as a scientist, and then his reputation as this racial symbol. And it was, it, for what it does, it, it's actually pretty good. Um, the other book was an uh, edited collection of Carver writings, really an annotated collection of Carver writings, uh, by Gary Kremer, uh, George Washington Carver in his own words, which was published in 1987. After that, silence on Carver. Uh, the next thing that was published in any sort of uh, scholarly journal on Carver scholarly history journal on Carver anyway, was, uh, came in 2006 when I published an article, so 19 years, which is quite a gap. So um, I was trying to figure out what it was that historians made of Carver, and they didn't seem to say anything about him. Now, there was a time when uh, historians knew just what to make of Carver. Uh, for a long time, Carver served as a contributionist hero for historians, proof in the flesh that African Americans were as capable as white Americans, right? That, uh, that white, uh, sup uh, white theories of racial superiority just didn't hold up to scrutiny. They just didn't work. Um, in the wake of the Civil Rights Movement, however, this became, in essence, uh, the sort of uh, a normative assumption. People just said, of course this is true. And Carver became less valuable to historians that way. In the 1970s, this former view, which had seen Carver as this contributionist hero, this great hero, was turned on its head, and Carver became an anti-hero in many uh, circles, uh, at least many, in, I would say in general, in scholarly circles. Uh, his reputation as a scientist was uh, debunked. Uh, he was attacked as an Uncle Tom, who, uh, maybe just to give you the brief uh, view, they said his reputation as a scientist was inflated. He hadn't really done all of these things that he is credited with, and the reason he was credited with doing these things was because he was, uh, he was um, older, he was unthreatening, um, he was uh, unscientific and that he didn't record these things, and that uh, he basically allowed himself to be exploited by this white majority, by the southern uh, white establishment, to become this famous guy. The classic work on this came in 1976. It was published in the Journal of Southern History. It's Barry McIntosh. The subtitle really says it all, The Making of a Myth that Carver's fame, he argues, um, actually 
and without any evidence to suggest this actually, argued that, it, that because Carver was famous, more deserving African-American scientists like Ernest Just and Charles Henry Turner didn't get any attention. Okay? Now, Linda McMurray uh, took, took this, uh, um, she, she challenged this. She said, look, you can't, att- you can't say that Carver's responsible for what people are saying about him. Right? It's not his fault if in 1923 the United uh, Daughters of the Confederacy honor him the same year that the NAACP uh, uh, gives him its Spingarn Medal, which is the highest honor the NAACP gives. And you just can't imagine two groups with more divergent interest in 1923 than the UDC and the NAACP. Okay? <laughs> but they both love Carver, and it goes on today. Uh, Carver is um, adopted by groups you would think have nothing in common, right? Evangelicals and uh, uh, the, the gay community. Um, you, it just keeps going. You, you wouldn't believe the groups that, uh, that adopt Carver, and really, they only see what they want to see in Carver. But, long story short, by the time McMurray's biography came out, this had been more or less established among historians. McMurray tried to say that's not the case, that you're just dealing with the myth and not, his, not the man and his real accomplishments. But she didn't meet with that much success. In an otherwise favorable review of McMurray's uh, work, a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, David Herbert Donald, concluded that the all-purpose black for Americans in the 1920s, Carver earned a place in the textbooks of his time, but he is no longer part of our usable past. Right? And I thought, my gosh, when I first read this, this is really rather harsh. Um, I'm not as famous as Carver. I haven't accomplished anything. I'd like to think that I have a place in the usable past. Right? <laughs> this seems, seems sort, of, uh, sort of extreme, if only for that reason. Um, and um, I began to, uh, to think sort of more seriously about this. Now, I tell my graduate students that they need to make what's known as a historiographical intervention in their writing, which means that a historiography is just a big word that means everything that has been written about a subject, all the historical work on a subject. And if you're going to make an intervention, you're going to say something new about this or tell the, the uh, other historians where they're wrong. And so I have to do this when I was writing my dissertation. And the obvious intervention for me when I was writing this was that Carver is very much part of our usable past. That you can't attack this myth of Carver and say that he doesn't matter anymore when you haven't dealt with the man. Okay? So that was the first part. There are other things that I uh, might find less interesting, uh, but that were very much in my mind about progressive era conservation, how it had some southern impulses, uh, about how it wasn't progressive era conservation, wasn't just about wilderness and forests in the American West or the Northeast, um, that it wasn't lily white, that there is a really vibrant African-American environmental tradition, that African-Americans have thought deeply about the natural world for a long time, and we can't just discount this because they uh, weren't founding organizations like the Sierra Club. Okay. So all of this was what I was thinking when I was writing the book from, the histor- for, from my scholar's perspective. But I also have a very uh, serious interest in public history, which is the same interested in reaching a much wider audience. To begin with, I hope, and in fact, when I was at Kansas, I was the director of two public history projects, right? So I really am uh, genuinely interested in this. Uh, in part, what I try to do is write a really readable book, an accessible book. That's the first thing. I mean, it's a scholarly book, and it's footnoted, it documents its sources. In the end, though, I hope it is genuinely um, genuinely accessible, genuinely readable. But there's another uh, component. Because if, if Carver um, was attacked and sort of discredited and rendered um, unimportant to uh, American historians, historians of, uh, of the American past, um, and I will point out college-level textbooks say nothing about Carver. You don't even find them in the index, which is sort of a curious thing. So uh, if, if that was true, right, uh, Carver hasn't lost any of this sort of prestige in the view of the public. Most Americans know who Carver is. He's still an iconic figure. He appears in television shows like American Dad, devoted an episode to him. Eddie Murphy's character, Shabazz K. Morton, uh, the most famous episodes about Carver. Uh, Seinfeld had an episode where, uh, uh, where Carver uh, factored very prominently. Uh, Undercover Brother has some nice lines about Carver. Stevie Wonder wrote a song about Carver, same old story. And, of course, there are myriad, uh, I can't even count, hundreds, I'm sure, 
of uh, juvenile and children's literature, children's books, about Carver. In these, they seem to reduce him to the peanut man, for the most part, which um, is a caricature that I'm not particularly comfortable with. It's the same caricature that got him attacked or sacked by, the, uh, by professional historians. And, um, but the point is, he still stands. These things are, are still out there. These are 2000s, right? And people still care about Carver. They still think he's interesting. They still, he's still a hero in the eyes of most Americans, right? Uh, in fact, if anything, his accomplishments are exaggerated even more in the popular American uh, uh, imagination today. In 2006, Southwest Airlines in-flight magazine, a friend of mine was flying Southwest and brought this to me, said, hey, there's something about Carver in here. It boasted that, and the magazine's called Spirit, that Carver salvaged the economy of the South in the early 1900s, developed 300 uses for peanuts, and my favorite part, it draws a connection between itself and Southwest Airlines. <laughs> The official snack of Southwest Airlines is the peanut. Carver's the peanut man. What airline would Carver fly? I mean, really, that's sort of the, 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 the whole implication here. But there's a lot more to Carver than this peanut man. And I think, I think the past really matters. Obviously, I'm, an, I'm a historian, right? I'm either a terrible hypocrite or I think the past really matters. And um, I think uh, there's a lot that can be learned from Carver. I think Carver still speaks to a lot of the central issues of today. We're at this rare moment in uh, American history, which hasn't happened since the progressive era, since Carver was working at Tuskegee, really first went to his first decades at Tuskegee, where people care about rural life and agriculture, where, this, where presidents are addressing this, right? Michelle Obama put an organic garden in, right? People are really dealing with this. Michael Pollan, had, at the beginning of 2010, had four books on the New York Times bestseller list at the same time, right? That says something. Uh, Wes Jackson's work at the Land Institute has attracted a lot of attention, and MacArthur Grant funding, MacArthur Genius Grants, right? Um, we're at this moment where, where it really cares, and we could go beyond this. I think Carver has something to say about rural development today, and rural development, whether we want to sort of deal with this or not, is going to be shaping the next 50, maybe 100 years as India and China begin to transform their economies to look more like West, in the West in terms of their production. And we saw a spate of farmer suicides, cotton farmer suicides in India about a decade ago, right? And I think Carver's experience in, uh, the, in the Black Belt of Alabama can speak to that, can provide something valuable to that. So this is how I came to this project. And this is what I was trying to do, all right? The end result was a book that wasn't really intended to be biographical but rather an examination of Carver's conservation and agricultural work. Okay? Since I traced that work, uh, since I traced the evolution of that work over his life, it's sort of de facto biographical. And so when uh, University of Georgia Press wanted to call it an environmental biography, I said, that's fine. They wanted to call it just George Washington Carver, an environmental biography. And I insisted on sticking with the title because those are Carver's words. In the 1930s, Carver looked back, 1936, he looks back over his life and he says everything that he's done, from his work to help, from helping impoverished sharecroppers early on, to his later work as a chemergist, um, uh, to his work with polio patients, he says, ultimately, my work is that of conservation. He thought of himself as a conservationist, and I think we need to take him seriously on this. What did he mean by this? How did he come to think of himself as a conservationist? So that's how I be, uh, that's, uh, that's the, uh, the book I came, I came up with. In retrospect, um, I would have, calling it a biography, I might have reframed some of the things I did in the book a little bit differently to make it look more biographical. Okay? Um, but nevertheless, uh, it, I think it is uh, effectively biographical. The real aim, what I really wanted to do, is reclaim Carver. I want people to uh, consider Carver, to take him seriously as a central figure in the American environmental tradition. That's my aim. And I, and I think, uh, not because I have a particular agenda, but because I think this is, how, what Carver, this is what Carver was really about. I think it's how he thought of himself. And I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's his most lingering uh, legacy. That progressive era conservation especially wasn't just about Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot and John Muir and the fight over Hetch Hetchy Dam in California or John Burroughs, or Cornell's Liberty Hyde Bailey, or all these famous people, right, that are associated with it, these iconic figures. 
but that Carver was part of it too, and that he was obscured from his connections. This had been obscured partly because of his race and partly because he became so iconic as the Peanut Man, right? And lastly, I suppose, because he's working with agriculture, which until recently wasn't considered a conservation thing, though he certainly thought of it in those terms. All right, so that's where I started and wanted to make sure we're not running too low on time. All right, that's how I came to write the book that I did. Let me tell you a little bit about the book that I did write. The heart of the book, I should say at the beginning, is Carver's progressive era campaign to improve the lives of impoverished black farmers in Macon County and the rest of Alabama's Black Belt, and by extension, the South, right? I think this is where he was doing his most significant lasting work, okay? But uh, to get there, you have to understand what happens. And so I set up the book, for the prologue is, starts in Macon County in 1896 with Carver stepping off the train. And this is because of what I want to set up is this collision of Carver's sensibilities and his training with the ecological realities, the social, the economic, the political realities, often rather ugly realities, of Macon County, Alabama in 1896. And what happens when these come together? What happens when, these, when we get the convergence of the twain, so to speak? To get there, you start with, I start with uh, Carver's childhood. Um, there's a lot that we don't know about Carver's childhood, mostly because it's not especially well documented. It's a fragmentary record. Some of the records we have disagree with each other. Just for instance, the 1870 census lists Carver as 10 years old. Do the math, he'd be born in 1860. The 1880 census lists him as 15 years old. It is a rather unusual person who ages five years over the course of 10, right? So what do we do? For a while, uh, park historians argue at the Carver National Monument after it was set up, argued that, well, Moses Carver, who's pictured here, and who was... Uh, Maybe Carver's owner, probably Carver's owner when he was an infant, but we can talk about that maybe. But he was uh, certainly, Carver, certainly adopted Carver, um, and uh, Carver spent the first 12 years of his life essentially on Moses Carver and Moses and Susan Carver's farm. So the first, the park historian said, well, he couldn't be Moses Carver, who knew Carver's whole life. He couldn't have been so important, uh, he couldn't have been so off on his age to think that he was 10 instead of 5, right? 1880, then later the park, census, uh, the park historians looked back and said, there's no way that Carver could have been five years off in his assessment of his own life in 1880. Right? If you're 15, you don't think you're 20. Right? So what do we do? The bottom line is that we just don't know. Uh, we don't even know the exact year in which Carver was born. Um, most uh, people are thinking 1864, late 1864. There's not any reason to really disagree with that. Um, Carver, in his earliest uh, autobiographical thing, said he was born at about the end of the Civil War, which would make it the spring of 1865. If that's the case, then he wasn't born into slavery because slavery had been abolished in Missouri in February of 1865. Um, if he was born in 1864, which is the date he settled on later, then he probably was born to slavery. For me, that's a distinction without a difference because he was a couple of months old. His mother, a different matter entirely. Carver probably doesn't matter uh, all that much. What does matter to me about Carver's childhood was that he was, uh, from an early age, displayed a real affinity for the natural world. There's just no question about that. Even uh, decades later, in the 1930s, looking back on his childhood, he would remember specific springs and the type of flowers that were around these springs. Um, real sort of detail stuff. And he became, in essence, an amateur naturalist early on. He would collect things, collected so many things that Susan Carver made him empty his pockets before he went into the house. Right? No more frogs, no more rocks, no more. Got to empty your, got to empty your, uh, got to empty your pockets. Um, the other thing that matters to me, or that I think is essential about, uh, in terms of shaping Carver's environmental thought, was that uh, he had an object lesson in the benefits of diversified farming, an object lesson in the benefits of what we would think of as the high-minded husbandry of the mid 19th century. Okay. In any event, uh, the most salient point about his uh, early years uh, was that he couldn't, that Missouri clamped down on the opportunities for education, okay? And so he had to leave the Carver farm uh, to get, uh, uh, to go in, in search of an education. Uh, in uh, 1876, Missouri essentially mandated segregated schools, okay? And if the county had fewer than, I think it's 20 African Americans, then they didn't have to provide any kind of school for uh, black children. All right. 
So Carver went down a few miles south uh, to a, a town called Neosho, but he knew as much as the teacher there. And so he joined uh, uh, a family that was heading west, part of a much larger migration, African-American migration, to Kansas at this time. Um, Kansas uh, uh, was attractive to African-Americans at the time because it was the home of John Brown, because it had fought so hard to remain a free state to oppose slavery. Uh, the, uh, the pretensions of this sort of uh, egalitarian ideology and the realities of life in Kansas were not connected, essentially. Um, and uh, Kansas uh, embraced the same sort of racial hardening that the, rest of the, that the rest of the nation did over the course of the late 19th century. And so Carver witnessed the lynching in Fort Scott. Uh, he bounced around to uh, Latha and Payola and eventually settled in the central Kansas village of Minneapolis where he, got his, where he graduated from high school. Um, got accepted, a very familiar part of the story, got accepted to a school in northeast Kansas, Highland College. Uh, by post, when he shows up at the door, they discover that he's black and they say, sorry, right? Uh, he settles in the local community briefly, but the people he settles with are in the process of, they're basically western boosters. They're in the process, process of moving people out to western Kansas, and Carver does what many young men, in the, many young Americans in the late 19th century did. He went west, looking for opportunities. He homesteaded in western Kansas. He uh, built a sod house, tried to prove up on his land, put crops in, planted trees, um, all sorts of things that all of his neighbors were doing. By all accounts, he was well-liked in the neighborhood. Um, we do know that he was continuing his, his activities as a naturalist. There's a, an account from the Nest City Times that says he has a greenhouse on his neighbor's property, all of these sorts of things. So in any event, um, uh, the eight, late 1880s were hard times on the plains, and Carver essentially... Uh, finds his way off the plains into Iowa, where through a series of fortunate relationships, he winds up at another religious college that accepts him, Simpson College in Indianola, uh, where he finds himself in the classroom of Etta Budd. Carver was a fantastic painter. He really is. If you haven't been to, the, uh, to any, either of the national monuments that celebrate Carver and have his paintings, it's worth going. He really is very gifted. Um, and he proved himself to this art teacher, Etta Budd. Etta Budd said, you're a great artist. But looking at the racial climate of the 1890s, she wasn't convinced that uh, a young black man could make a living as an artist. And so she said, um, just seeing his interest in plants, seeing his interest in sort of the, the natural world, that maybe the thing for him to do uh, would be to pursue a degree in agricultural science. I should point out that one other really important thing happened that I didn't tell you. He became, the Corbers weren't religious people. He became a devout Christian sometime while he was in Kansas maybe as soon as uh, when he went down to Neosha. Um, the timing doesn't matter. What matters is he is, he is a devout uh, Christian, and he, and he comes to believe that God has ordained this plan for his life, that God has chosen him to go to uh, school, to go to uh, Iowa Agricultural College, where he can pursue a degree in agricultural science and go down and help his uh, struggling black brethren in the South. So, Etta Bud's father one of the best-known horticulturists in all, of the, uh, in, in all of America, maybe all of the world at this time, is Joseph Lancaster Budd, and he smooths the admission process for Carver. Carver gets into the Iowa Agricultural College, and he gets an agricultural education par excellence. Um, so I can make this thing. James Wilson was, secretary of Ag was one of Carver's teachers, and he was the Secretary of Agriculture under three different presidents. Uh, Henry C. Wallace was not only the father of Henry A. Wallace, who would uh, be the Secretary of Ag Henry A. Wallace would be the Secretary of Agriculture under FDR, uh, and later FDR's Vice President, but he was also, Henry Wallace himself was in the 1920s, the Secretary of Agriculture. So he's studying under really important, uh, up-to-date uh, agricultural scientists. But none of these men factored as prominently in Carver's life as the relatively obscure botanist and mycologist, Lewis Herman Pamel. Lewis Herman Pamel is a name probably, um, maybe you've read some biographies of Carver, he's come up, but um, uh, Pamel is not a, no, not a well-known name. But he's the first person in the English, to, write in, to write a book with the term ecology in its title in the English language. He wrote that in 1893, which is the same year that English, that uh, there was a botanical meeting that settled on the spelling of ecology. It's not the same, so the whole notion of an ecosystem doesn't even happen until the 1930s. Okay, so it's a different thing. But 
uh, the fundamental assumptions are there. And Carver will later uh, write to Pamela, Carver will assert on numerous occasions that no one shaped his education as much as Lewis Herman Pamela. So Carver was pursuing his graduate work. He graduates, he becomes, he's the first African American to matriculate at uh, Iowa Agricultural College. He's the first to become a teacher there because he becomes a teacher when he's a graduate student and he's the first graduate student there. Um, he does his graduate work under Pamela, very influenced by him. While he's there, um, he gets, a, uh, gets a, an unsolicited invite from Alcorn College, Alcorn Agricultural Mechanical College in Mississippi, to come down and be a professor. And shortly after that, while he's still mulling that offer, he gets uh, a letter from uh, a desperate Booker T. Washington. Right? Booker T. Washington, uh, who had burst on the national scene a year earlier, in 1895, uh, with his Atlanta Exposition Address, which became sort of quintessential expression of accommodationism. A little bit overblown, but nevertheless, um, he's the most, he becomes the most famous black man in America. And Carver, when he gets a letter from Booker T. Washington, takes this as an affirmation that God has chosen him to bring the science, gospel of scientific agriculture to his people in the South. Okay? So, um, though he plays a little bit hard to get, he accepts the position, and in October of 1896, makes it to Macon County, Alabama. The Black Belt of Alabama, he, writes, he wrote to Lewis Pamel, uh, was a strange world, right? He found himself um, uh, in, in, a, in a strange place and, sur uh, and surrounded by strange people, right? Part of this has to do with institution. He is, there are a bunch of issues at Tuskegee that he has to deal with. Um, there's a whole lot of work. Booker T. Washington judged his faculty on how hard or how much above and beyond the call of duty they were willing to go uh, in the service of the school. Um, there's constant infighting because Washington's also traveling, all, often off traveling. So there's lots going on. But the more significant thing for the purposes of this, of the book I wrote, was that it was very different economically, socially, politically, and ecologically. And Carver described it as a world of barren and furrowed hillsides and wasted valleys, where the denuded soils rewarded those who worked them with another mortgage as an unpleasant reminder of the year's hard labor. Uh, Carver had arrived then with a head full of ideas, a profound religious appreciation for the natural world. In fact, his uh, deep Christianity and his uh, religious appreciation for the world became so interconnected that it's almost impossible to disentangle them, to say where one ends and the other begins. Okay? So he already had that. He, already, he arrived with, an, uh, with a basic knowledge of the, of the premises of ecology. Right? And he arrived with a very thorough scientific training. That said, he was utterly unprepared <laughs> for what he encountered. And it was tough for him to deal with it. He attacked the problems that were uh, plaguing uh, the, the tenant farms that surrounded uh, uh, Tuskegee Institute with a great deal of vigor. But he attacked them initially in the same sort of way that conventional agricultural scientists do. Two of his first three bulletins, for instance, uh, that he published from the uh, experiment station were um, about the application of chemically compounded fertilizers, basically chemical inputs. And he pretended, or he at least he thought, maybe he was honest, I, I don't know, uh, but he wrote in the first one, he described what these things look like as if, as if uh, black farmers weren't putting these on their land because they didn't know what they were, right? Not because they couldn't afford them and their landlords wouldn't advance them more uh, rents to do it, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't advance the money to do it. Uh, but over time, pretty quickly, in fact, um, he came to a, a embrace uh, a much different, a, a divergent agricultural vision, one that, is, that was in marked contrast to the central uh, impulses, to the, the, the main impulses of, con of conventional agronomy. Pro uh, as a general rule, uh, progressive era of agricultural science was about streamlining production to make food cheaper. So to make food cheaper, you need to increase uh, yields. So you want to uh, increase yields, and uh, it was about um, making uh, agriculture more of a business, whereas prior to the Civil War, the farmer was the ideal American. By 1900, the uh, professional was the ideal American. Okay? So it, it's about these sorts of things. So it's the, the application of up-to-date technologies, the application of fertilizers, the um, increase of production, the trying to maximize profit. And Carver eventually rejects all of that. He comes to reject the uh, application of up-to-date technology. He rejects the application of chemically compounded fertilizers. Uh, and he even rejects the notion that we should judge success by yields and profits, okay? which is pretty surprising. 
Um, he waged his campaign, I should point out, in four ways. The first two of them are pictured up here. First two of them, uh, obviously he's teaching in Tuskegee's classrooms. And when he's teaching there, he's trying to equip the next generation of teachers to go out and bring this gospel of scientific agriculture with them. And he also began lecturing off of uh, Tuskegee's campus. And this is where he first gains a great deal of, uh, his first measure of fame. Not a great deal of fame yet, but his first measure of fame. He be, he's a very electrifying speaker. Uh, he always illustrates it with, uh, with you know, some, something like a cotton plant or a sweet potato or, or whatever. But what Carver was not advocating was a system. He was not trying to replace this conventional agronomy with what we would call organic agriculture, although a lot of what he advocated fits into that model. Right? I do think that over the course of this campaign, he becomes a prophet of sustainable agriculture, a prophet of ecological agriculture. Um, but what he's interested mostly in doing is getting people to think about the world differently, to see the world with new eyes, to reconceive the entire world around them. Where they had previously seen weeds, he says, look, there's food, right? Dandelions, you can eat those, wild onions, wild plums, and here's how you can preserve them, right? Um, and uh, he tells them, he, he tells his students and he tells his uh, uh, for that matter, the clay they walk on. You could go on forever. The, the, the clay they walk on, there are paints for you. Uh, the wild plants that are on, on, the, on the footpaths that connect these, uh, there are about 50 communities in Macon County, the footpaths that connect them to each other. He says, look, there's all sorts of, uh, he says, rare beauty and fragrance are available for the taking if you're willing to go do, just collect these, uh, these plants. Um, you don't need to buy chemical fertilizers because there's, um, there, the forest produces these, these leaves. You can just compost them. Right? You, can, you can extract yourself from the vagaries of this market economy just by reconceiving the world around you. So he says that we do not recognize the problem that black farmers were facing. He says that they, do not, they didn't recognize and appreciate what nature has uh, so lavishly provided for us. And again, we are richer, he would tell people over and over, than we think we are. Okay. Um, the other two prongs of his campaign were his work at the experiment station and the bulletins he published from there. Uh, which all of these have limits, and the book I explain the limits of all these. Don't have time today. Um, and then he uh, helped uh, foster the, uh, the extension service at Alabama, uh, or the, the extension movement in, uh, from Tuskegee. So actually taking the stuff to the farmers themselves, taking this knowledge to the farmers themselves. And I can't really read this. Um, but the hallmark of his, of his uh, campaign was his belief that... Um, the progressive farmer wasn't the one who produced the most, or who thought, uh, or who uh, had the most up-to-date implements, or used the most chemical fertilizer. But, uh, to, in his words, the farmer who had come to recognize the mutual dependence of the animal, mineral, and vegetable kingdoms, and how utterly impossible it is for one to exist in a highly organized state without the others. What does this sound like? This is ecology, <laughs> right? The mutual dependence of the animal, mineral, and vegetable kingdoms. This is. He's saying the progressive farmer is the farmer is the one is, is the one who has learned to think ecologically, not the one who produces the most. Now his campaign, in short, send uh, this topical here. I should point out is just more proof that he's trying to get them to think, uh, embrace a way of thinking to reconceive the world around them. Because if you put some of this, he couldn't possibly. He would say give you all the suggestions you would need to be a progressive farmer. But once you start doing some of these things, you'll be, see other opportunities. Because if you can use a sweet potato like this, then you can use something else like this, and it goes on and on. In any event, um, his campaign made uh, good progress for a little while. Okay? When he showed up in 1896, there were about 150 uh, black landowners in Macon County. By the time World War I comes, there are more than 500. Okay? Now, not all of this can be credited to Carver. Tuskegee is doing, making loans available and uh, uh, low-interest loans available to uh, local residents, uh, et cetera. There are good schools, the availability of Tuskegee, the proximity of Tuskegee. All these things factor in. It's not a monocausal solution here. But Carver's campaign is, seems to be making real progress here. Okay? Um, unfortunately, World War I was sort of the high point of it, and it began to decline after that. Um, and this has, uh, has to do with two things. Uh, one is that Carver begins to lose interest as he becomes more and more famous and his attention gets diverted elsewhere. 1921, of course, he's going to go before Congress. 
and essentially usher in the era of the peanut man. Okay. Um, but more significantly was that Carver's campaign ultimately foundered on the political uh, and social and uh, economic realities of the Jim Crow South. There were certain things that no matter how sound his advice was, he couldn't overcome. If landlords um, could, kick, uh, could kick tenants off just because they felt like it, there's nothing you can do about that. If you improve the soil of the land you're working, the farm you're working as a tenant farmer, the landlord will charge you more rent, right? And if you do become a landowner, and there are, I cite plenty of cases in the, in the book, and it's heartbreaking to read these for me, but, um, you know, uh, the law didn't protect you, right? You could be legally pushed off your land, actually illegally pushed off your land, but the law would protect you anyway, okay? And so in the midst of this sort of climate, there was little that, that he could do. There were, there were sort of real limits to it. All right. So, in 1921, uh, uh, he becomes the peanut man. Um, he, his attention is diverted to uh, a number of lines. Uh, Kemergy becomes uh, one of the ways it's diverted to, which is the sort of the industrial applications of uh, agricultural products like peanuts, like sweet potatoes. Uh, also, he begins working with polio patients. Uh, uh, and he becomes a hero of the evangelical community, uh, white and black for his eagerness to credit God for his accomplishments. He gets uh, attacked in some ways for this. But in the 1930s, he does return to this initial concern he had for impoverished black farmers. Uh, he rejects the... the, uh, 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 the, he, stops giving the he stops being willing to do the peanut exhibit. He says this is only of use to a few people in the peanut industry and maybe a few curious people, so I'm not going to do it anymore. Uh, by the time he returns to this campaign, however... The world he began to work with was just irrevocably gone. People began to think of, uh, of cars and that sort of thing as, as necessary. Tractors were beginning to appear. And you can't manufacture these things on self-sufficient farms, no matter how hard you try. Um, so in, 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 in some ways, Carver's campaign uh, met with meager success. But that does not mean, I would argue, that Carver is not, doesn't matter. I would argue that the New Deal efforts to reform agriculture didn't accomplish all that much more. And that doesn't render them unimportant either. So I think we're about out of time. Uh, let me just, uh, I guess, close by being willing to take questions. Is that okay? In the five minutes, are you sure? I can take questions anyway. Yeah. We can keep this informal. Yes? Uh, just a moment. Oh. Uh, speak into the microphone, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. You notice I was in your amen corner the entire <laughs> time you were speaking. My name is Dr. Elaine Harrington from Tuskegee. And I have with me members of the George Washington Carver Arts and Crafts Festival that we sponsor each year. And in doing so, we get the students involved in the entire Macon County School District uh, reading and studying and writing about Dr. Carver. We give them a theme and what have you. I want to, not so much a question, but I really want you to come to Tuskegee soon because there is about, there are about a dozen uh, former students of Dr. Carver. And I think you would love to sit and listen to them talking about their experience with Dr. Carver as a student. So I want to really invite you to come to Tuskegee, and I'll coordinate with you before I leave today. My, my question, my question, my question. Where does Dr. Carver fit today in this whole matter of conservation and uh, environmental whatever you want to call it? Where, where does he fit today? Okay. That's a, thank you for that question. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, obviously, I think Carver matters a great deal today. <laughs> I think, um, let me answer this in a couple of ways. One, I think Carver anticipated more clearly the direction in which, in which uh, environmental concerns were going than what they were at the time. Um, when the whole Love Canal episode came in the 1980s, um, no environmental organizations 
rush to the aid of these people who were being poisoned. That was a public health issue. Carver, of course, integrated all of this. And I, I think um, since then, um, environmental organizations have focused on public health more, and they've since begun to focus on agriculture more. And that is where, where Carver's ad advice would fit. There are a couple of other implications from his campaign that I think are equally important. One is that we can't really talk about effective conservation if we don't, um, uh, if, if we don't also think about addressing uh, egregious um, social inequities, right? That, 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 that the tour of a piece. Carver's campaign ultimately didn't achieve what he wanted it to achieve. You live in Macon County. It doesn't look like Carver wanted it to look. Um, um, in some ways, it's a profoundly uh, uh, impoverished community today, like much of Alabama's Black Belt. And uh, this is a result of policies that were quite different from Carver's, right? Uh, and you could say, well, Carver doesn't matter because it, 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 it didn't work. But I think that the real lesson is that no matter how good the idea is, if you don't uh, account for these social and uh, economic and political factors too, you're, it, it's ultimately going to fail. And we see this in places in, uh, in uh, I, already, I mentioned in India with the, uh, the cotton farmer uh, suicides. Um, there's a, I don't know that Carver embraced, there was a movement in the 1970s called the Appropriate Technology Movement. Um, it drew on Ernst Schumacher's Small is Beautiful, a very uh, influential book. Uh, it was a much bigger um, economic indictment of uh, the world than Carver was making. Right? Carver was, didn't think in profoundly political or economic terms, frankly. He tried to circumvent <laughs> political and, and economic uh, and economic problems. But uh, the appropriate technology movement, if you boil some, one, the agricultural aspect of it down, was the, said that um, certain technologies, uh, well, technology should be applied as, as they're appropriate in certain settings, under certain conditions, with certain expectations. And one of the reasons we had this spate of farmer suicides in India uh, was because they have to buy their seed from, uh, from American producers of seed. They have to apply these, these they have to, they're using all these chemicals, but they don't have the right means to, uh, to, uh, to uh, apply it. They have too small a plots to do it, right? And ultimately, I think lots of these people um, poignantly took their own lives by drinking the pesticide that they were buying. And so I, I, this is one of the, you know, the world's just going to see more and more and more of this today. And Carver's dealing with sort of lived-in places. And it's easy to want to conserve places that aren't as densely settled. And I think the environmental movement's real challenge going forward is dealing with more densely settled areas where people, where nature isn't out there, but uh, we're part of it and we're, we have to interact with it in responsible ways. Thank you. Uh, I enjoyed talk. Thank you. Uh, I've, I've visited Mobile. They had a large exhibition on, uh, on Carver uh, within the last year or so, uh, two years maybe. Uh, one of the things that they exhibited uh, various artifacts from his, his career and a few of his paintings. Uh, it was mentioned uh, next to a display of some of his laboratory equipment that uh, uh, they were much underfunded at Tuskegee and they had to make most much of their equipment or a drill press or some kind of thing they needed to make. So they had they wanted to make something, they had to make the equipment uh, much of the time. Do you think uh, Carver? He had wonderful accomplishments. What might he have accomplished uh, even much more if he he'd uh, had better circumstances from uh, uh, financially? Well, that's a it's a good question, and it's uh, not one that's easy to answer, right? Um, the concept of uh, amor fati, love fate. I mean, Carver became famous in part because he had to deal with these really tough situations, and he found really ingenious solutions to these really tough situations. He gave serious thought. Uh, in uh, 1900 and 1901 to pursuing a Ph.D. under one of the leading botanists in America at the Shaw School of Botany in, in St. Louis, the same guy that Lewis Pamel had worked under. Um, and if he had, I'm, I'm sort of of the opinion that he might have been a more accomplished scientist. He would have cleared all the hurdles that, people, that the people who scuttled his reputation in the 1970s as a scientist say he didn't clear, right? Well, but I'm not sure anyone would have heard of him. And I'm not sure he, how many mycologists can anyone name, right? You know, I mean, it's just, so he might have been, in that sense, a better, pure scientist. 
Uh, but I don't think he would have accomplished as much. And part of the reason that he adopted this vision that he did is because he had to, because he had to make do with what he had, you know. And he was forever writing people. He's like, can I can I use an incubator for bacteriological experiments? Can I find multiple uses for these things? Uh, and because he had to deal with so little, it forced him in some ways to deal with conditions at least comparable to those at uh, to those that. Uh, he would, he, would, he would say a, a one-horse farmer had to deal with. Um, uh, now, he had much greater access to this, and uh, I don't want to overplay that because he made a deliberate decision to, to eschew the chemical, particularly the chemical fertilizers, which he was ob- obliged as, uh, under the under actually USD federal government law, but also under Alabama law to do fertilizer analyses. Um, but he made a deliberate decision to do that, and that wasn't just about what he had. So the answer is, uh, I, I suspect he could have done more with better, I mean, who wouldn't do more with better, you know, if he were better healed, you know, uh, better equipped. Um, but it would have been a very different carver that we were talking about today. What were you saying? He, he eschewed fertilizer analysis? Of- well, he, he, had to do, he, he had to deal with, with chemical fertilizers to some degree. Um, but as early as 1902, He's writing, telling the USDA that he's doing more and more switching to compost manuring. Uh, he's obligated to work with chemical fertilizers because that's uh, part of the way these things, uh, the uh, experiment stations were funded. Uh, and also under law, they're required to deal with chemical fertilizers. They, they're, they're required, if, if a farmer brings one in for an analysis, you have to give it. So he, he, he has to deal with them, but he doesn't want to. He's, it's, it's not just a, it's not just a, a, a nod to what he has to do because he doesn't have limited because he has limited equipment. It really is a deliberate decision on his part. Uh, I've enjoyed your presentation a great deal. It, it's apparent that you have very thorough knowledge of George Washington Carver, and I wonder if um, if Dr. Carver were here today, if he could be here today and could tell us just one thing or a couple of things. Um, what do you think he would tell us? Well, this is what historians can do well because they can make up whatever they want. Um, uh, it's a good question. Let me, before I give you a, a, a real direct answer, let me, uh, uh, let me say that one of the humbling things, I, I, I do know a lot about Carver. One of the humbling things about writing a biography is how little you wind up knowing about the person you write this book on, how much more you would like to know. Um, and it makes me wonder, as a historian, if my whole field isn't doomed. Because if I can't understand Carver, how can I understand the United States, or the South, or Alabama, or the Black Belt, or whatever I'm writing about, right? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, with that caveat in mind, um, I suspect it would depend on the on the group uh, he was uh, he was talking to. I su- um, I suspect it would be um, something along from his religious lines. I would I suspect he would say uh, something like, go out there and commune in nature. This is how God speaks to you. This is how you, have, this is how you commune with the divine. And this is what life is really... You'll never make anything of yourself unless you know who you are in relative to the creation uh, and, and the creator. Um, I suspect that's how he thought most of the time. That's what most of his letters to his students who wrote him for advice was. You know? What is... <laughs> That's hard to say, right? <laughs> yeah, the microphone. Right back here. Okay. About 25 miles down the road from Tuskegee is another land grant college or a land grant college. My question is: Did Dr. Washington Carver um, did he ever do any consulting or working with all these Alabama Politics Institute? Um. He knew the people at Auburn. The people at Auburn knew him. Um, Auburn was mostly a foil for him, uh, which is to say that uh, Booker T. Washington would hold up Auburn as the standard. They're producing X number bulletins. Why aren't you doing that? He's like, they have six PhDs. I have a bunch of high school students in myself, and I'm in charge of two farms. And that wasn't an excuse for Washington. Sort of keep amping it up. Um, Carver took... There was some 
I, I hinted at the fact that the Tuskegee faculty was divided about how they felt about Carver. And for many of them, he was an outsider. Uh, one of Carver's closest friends refused to give his papers to Tuskegee, gave it to the National Monument instead, because he thought Carver was always treated badly there. Um, uh, that is a matter of, uh, of, of opinion, of course. Um, let me... Uh, um, Carver, there were always critics who thought that Carver's plans were impractical. In fact, in a review of two biographies that came out in 1943, right after Monroe, right after Carver died, Monroe Work, who was a key figure at Tuskegee, wrote that um, uh, both biographies had it wrong, that we don't have an honest biography of Carver because Carver was basically impractical, and he hinted at this struggle that involved the poultry yard and how Carver was stripped of his position and all this sort of stuff. So Carver loved when Auburn University, when the experiment station, took ideas that he had written first, that he had published first, and published them as their own. So he would, he would take great delight in that, and he would show it, he would have it marked and sent to Booker T. Washington and say, look, people thought I was crazy, but Auburn's saying the same thing now. They thought we couldn't grow wheat, look, Auburn's saying we can grow wheat. Thought acorns were a bad feed for uh, uh, livestock or for uh, hogs. Look, Auburn's saying it's a good food for, for hogs. So I'm not as crazy as you think I am. We have one more question. <laughs> my question, uh, I enjoyed your question uh, very much, but my question has to do with many have criticized Carver for not patenting his works. Do you, in your research, did you um, unveil anything that gave his opinion about well, to some degree. Uh, this is one of the things that uh, Carver was always forever fighting with uh, Booker T. Washington's brother, who headed um, one of the divisions at Tuskegee, and their, their duties overlapped. And uh, John H. Washington would criticize uh, Carver for not doing anything practical again. Uh, and he hinted at the patents for the paints. He says, look, this isn't, this isn't patent. It's not industrial, industrially marketable and all that stuff. And Carver wrote back and said, that's not my aim. Right? My aim was to find a way for impoverished black farmers, impoverished farmers who didn't care the race really, to, uh, to take, take hold of the world around them and beautify their dwellings. Carver loved things that were beautiful. He was a great artist. It, it bothered him that, that the people in, uh, surrounding Tuskegee lived in such uh, decrepit, I think is a good word, dwellings for the most part. He said, look, you can beautify this. So it, it wasn't really his aim. The only patent he did patent a, a, a couple of things. The only patent that he, was, he did get and was stern or uh, really eager to defend was his uh, penal, which was to rub, to, uh, was to, uh, a medicine basically for polio patients. And uh, basically the USDA said it didn't have any, not the USDA, uh, yeah, the government, I can't remember which organization, said he didn't have any, it, it didn't really have any medical benefits anymore. I didn't really have any medical benefits. And he said, and he was upset because he thought, not because he wasn't going to make money on it, he had made, you know, he never made a whole lot of money anyway, but um, that wasn't really his interest, but because he really thought it worked. And he was afraid that people were, um, uh, that, the government, that the government was going to undermine a potentially really useful medicine. Looking at it, looking back at it in hindsight, the government's probably right. I'm not sure that the oil itself did anything. The massaging probably did whatever good it was going to do. So he wasn't really particular about patents, is the, is the thing. Uh, I'm sorry, our time is up, but Dr. Hersey will be here after the program, so if you have questions, please come and speak to him. And also, his book is available for sale in the hall, uh, in the lobby area, by friends of the Alabama Archives. Thank you for coming today, and thank you, Dr. Hersey. Thank you.